Migration is one of the most contentious issues facing Western governments. Can the UK's new plan to actually invest in the countries where many migrants come from really work? Hello and welcome to Roundtable. I'm Enda Brady. Now, British Prime Minister Keir Starmer plans to invest £84 million over three years to address the root causes of illegal migration into the UK. He wants to work with the Global South and European leaders to tackle it at source. But can the plan work where so many previous ones have failed? <laughs> Scenes like these over the summer have shaken the UK to its core. Anti-immigration rioters hurled objects at police and broke several windows at a hotel used to house asylum seekers. These protests triggered by the killing of three young girls. Some on social media falsely claimed the alleged perpetrator had immigrated to the UK illegally and was of Muslim origin. He was, in fact, born in the UK to Rwandan parents. Successive governments over the last two decades have tried to stem mounting anger at the growing number of migrants who arrive in the UK every year, most of them by legal means. Despite those efforts, net migration, the difference between those arriving and leaving, continues to climb. Among the first policy proposals by the UK's recently elected Labour government has been another such attempt. Prime Minister Keir Starmer has scrapped the previous Conservative administration's plan to send illegal migrants to Rwanda. His government now wants to invest in the economies of the Middle East and Africa to encourage people to stay at home rather than make at times perilous journeys to the UK. To stop illegal migration, we must also tackle it at source. So today I'm announcing £84 million of new funding for projects across Africa and the Middle East. That includes humanitarian and health support, skills training, help with job opportunities and access to education. The plan would try to help Syrian refugees in Jordan and Lebanon access education, improve skills and find employment opportunities. It would fund migrants in North and East Africa to help them find local jobs and prevent them from travelling onwards to the UK. And Starmer's plan would provide food, water and shelter to about 200,000 of the more than 8 million people displaced by the conflict in Sudan. Starmer also wants to set up a new border security command, bringing together border force officials, police and intelligence agencies to combat people smuggling gangs. Italy's Prime Minister Giorgio Meloni already has a similar migration initiative in place. Announced in 2022, Italy is investing $6 billion into Africa. However, like the UK, immigration continues to rise. According to the Italian Interior Ministry, in 2023, Italy experienced a 50% increase in migrants arriving by boat compared to the previous year. Some British media have reported that Starmer plans to work with Maloney to reduce levels of illegal migration. Can efforts to boost the economies of some of the most deprived parts of the world keep migrants from seeking a life in Europe? Well, let's bring in our guests. Claire Pearsall is a former special advisor at the UK Home Office. She's currently chief of staff for Conservative MP Caroline Noakes. Peter Herbert is a retired UK immigration judge and chair of the Society of Black Lawyers. And Norman Baker is a former Liberal Democrat minister in the UK Home Office. You're all very welcome to Roundtable. Peter, I'll come to you first. It's fair to say successive Conservative governments failed on this issue. What leads us to think Keir Starmer might do any better? Well, I think that the announcement that they're going to abandon this nonsensical Rwandese deportation policy is a good start. Um, the fact that they are talking about concentrating resources into assessing asylum applications, because if you can't assess people, then you can't refuse their decisions. And if you can't refuse them or accept them, they, can't, they don't have a right of appeal. And if they don't have a right of appeal, they can't be removed. So in a sense, you can talk about removals as much as you like, but you won't get there unless you invest in the decision-making process. So the start appears to be good. 
But also, I think one thing which is absolutely essential is people seem to forget that the reason we're in this mess about, so-called mess about small boats, is that there was a agreement with the EU that those people who'd applied for asylum in Europe, in safe third countries, if they had applied and came to the UK in spite of that, would be removed back to the EU. In Boris's oven-ready deal, that was abandoned. And so the small boats only became a phenomena largely because of the inability of the UK to government to negotiate a sensible solution with the EU on leaving the European Union. Claire, give us your assessment of what Starmer might do differently. I think what Keir Starmer is looking to do is uh, bolster up uh, border security by looking at what is going on overseas, which is a good way of doing this. You, people traffickers are taking people's money, some very vulnerable people. You need to get to the root of that. However, there is also an announcement of £84 million, which is going to be spent in North and East Africa, across into places like Jordan and Lebanon, which sounds really impressive. But when you start to break it down, it doesn't mean very much money for each area. And I think if you are looking to tackle the Middle East, North Africa route, which is well known for where migrants are going to come across from uh, and those kind of war-torn areas and disputed areas, that's fine. But really, you need to put more money and more, more resources into it. And there is no um, hope of anybody actually looking at how it's going to be measured. What sort of success are you looking at? How is that money being spent? And who is keeping an eye on it? So I think that whilst it sounds very good, Keir Starmer, unfortunately, is looking to do what the previous government did, my own government, throwing money at a problem which isn't going to solve it. Norman, what do you think Starmer can do quickly, differently, to get these numbers down? Quickly, not very much at all in terms of getting numbers down. I mean, Peter's right that the, the way the previous government dealt with the EU was a disaster uh, in all sorts of ways, including in terms of immigration. So, of course, what we can do is we can process people more quickly. We can, we can refuse those people who shouldn't be here and have them removed, as we indeed we should do. We can get deals individually with uh, in EU countries, I suppose, in a way we've done with Albania, which was actually one of the things that the government, the Tory government did, was actually quite sensible. We can look at other such arrangements, perhaps on the EU-wide basis, to try and help the process. But ultimately, you have to remember that most people who claim asylum here um, have their cases upheld. In other words, most people who come here claiming asylum are genuine asylum seekers who are running for fear of their lives or fear of torture or because they're gay in a country that doesn't allow people to be gay, that sort of thing. Uh, and therefore, you know, processing people will actually increase the numbers who stay here because they are legitimate cases. Uh, there's a much wider problem here. The wider problem is that we're now seeing mass movements of people across the world in a way we haven't done since World War II. And it's going to exacerbate, not simply because of the unstable nature of many countries in the world, but because, for example, of environmental reasons. Climate change is going to make a whole lot of places uninhabitable. Uh, water shortages are now becoming an issue. Water is becoming a, a cause for war, or for dispute between countries. So uh, we, can, we can sort out the system as best we can and make it more tolerable over here, which Darm was beginning to do. But ultimately, the mass movement of people is going to increase. Peter, let's talk about the money side of this. The figure is £8 million a day on hotel accommodation for people seeking asylum. I mean, mm. this has to reach breaking point at some stage, doesn't it? One of the easiest things to do is let people work. <laughs> you know? I mean, it's very simple. Why on earth you should warehouse people at public expense when they are perfectly capable of working in their communities? They can be regulated, they can pay tax, and they are gainfully employed. There is absolutely no necessity to have a huge hotel bill that is driven by the refusal to allow people to work. The average asylum case may take two or three years to trundle through the system, even at the, with the best will in the world. So that is one very legitimate reason that you could reduce that bill. And the second is to involve local communities. If you seek to, in a sense, parachute in, asylum seekers in a hotel and don't engage the local community, it's a recipe for trouble. But if you involve them and they work in the local religious institutions, mosques, gurdwaras, temples, churches, and even if you allow the government to pay a minimum wage 
for working um, in cleaning, in environmental uh, issues, a whole range of things, but use some imagination. It doesn't have to be this way at all. Claire, why don't governments allow these people to work? Because let's be honest here, when we mention communities, a lot of what we've seen in England in the last few weeks, riots, is there's a feeling at community level that these are people who are sponging the system, yeah. getting something for free. Why should they be in a hotel when I've got to work? Would that take away some of that rhetoric if they were allowed to work? Oh, right. A very complicated situation, but in the short, no, it wouldn't, because those people who are fearful of people coming in from other countries are going to say they're not only just coming over here living in hotels, they're now coming for our jobs. So you have that rhetoric that you need to be able to deal with. But the problem when you look at the right to work, and I looked at this at the Home Office for on a number of occasions, is you give somebody a footprint into the system in the United Kingdom. So they will have a national insurance number. They will be paying tax, which I think most people would think is a good thing. What happens is if they are then unsuccessful, what do you do, what do, you do with that money? Because that can be used as a legitimate claim then that they've got some say in the United Kingdom, they've paid tax for maybe two or three years. They are going to argue or lawyers will argue that they have paid in, so therefore they have more of a tie here to them than in their home countries. So there is that problem. But there's also the problem of our taxation system isn't particularly flexible. Mm -hmm. So issuing temporary national insurance numbers, which can be done, isn't that easy. It isn't straightforward. And you also do have to have the identity of the individual. And in most cases, it's the identity of the individual which is the difficult part of processing them because you need to get clarification from countries of origin, which is why this all takes so long. So there are many, many problems. And it will only ramp up that more right-wing attitude of they are being given something ahead of us if you allow them to work. Norman, let's just look at the numbers. So. The small boats, they keep coming. On Saturday alone, 492 people mm -hmm. arrived into England. That takes the tally for the year, as of Saturday evening, to 19,066. That's up 10% on last year's, where we were at this point last year, 17,346. So it's getting worse year on year, isn't it? Well, let's have some perspective in the sense that if you look at what other European Union countries are uh, having to deal with in terms of numbers, that's quite a small number compared to what places like Greece and Italy and so on have to deal with, point one. And Greece and Italy haven't fallen over as societies. They carry on. Secondly, uh, for people who are concerned about migration or immigration, the numbers coming on small boats is a tiny proportion of those who are coming uh, overall into the country. So you have to look at that overall figure. Um, I, I have to say, I, I, I took the view Peter just expressed when I was at the Home Office and suggested that they should be allowed to work. And I think, actually, politically, it could be sold to say these people are going to pay their dues while they're here. That's how you can sell it. You can sell it to a right-wing audience. I have to say that the Home Secretary at the time almost fell off a chair when I suggested they should, they should be allowed to work. But, you know, I think, actually, so that's less damaging in terms of morale for the public than to say, we'll put you up for, at no charge to you in this hotel. And let's be quite clear, these people coming into the country, many of them, are, they're not kind of the people Donald Trump describes as coming across the border of Mexico, you know, rapists and everything else and criminals. These people are often doctors or nurses or teachers or professors. They're people who've got experience in their own country, who are often quite intelligent and educated. And the reason they're in fear of their lives is because they've actually challenged probably the country they come from, the government they're in. Those sorts of people can be very useful in our country. So we need to change the way these people are perceived you know, and getting to work and contribute to communities is one way of doing that. Peter, just another issue as well I want to look at. The whole system of processing applications, mm. there's a massive logjam. Well, there shouldn't be. It's about numbers. But let just take issue with the, the, the point. I actually disagree fundamentally about this. No, they can't work. You don't have to dance to a right-wing agenda at all. There's a whole difference between racism and a right-wing agenda, which is fueled by that. And there's nothing to do with... Um, this person's got my job. No, they generally haven't got their job because you don't have one, nor do you intend to have one. And in relation to that is they can then pay for some of that accommodation. But also, as a lawyer, you will never, virtually never, argue your right to remain in the United Kingdom under a right to family life simply because you've worked. 
it will not happen. So that, that suggestion is only if you have a, a husband or wife or a child here, or you are caring for an elderly, infirm relative. The suggestion that because you work for a couple of years, you have a right to remain doesn't fly in, in human rights law. So just the, 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 the point that you, you, you did raise, um, I, I think you have to look at the, the whole of the issues. Um, and it, it is about having a constructive and imaginative approach. And actually, just to say, the Home Office already allow many people to work, by the way. They don't fly it, but they do. Uh, and that, that is a practical thing which many societies have, have come to view as necessary. Claire, there seems to be a reluctance at government level to let these people work. Mm -hmm. I mean, the rhetoric from the far right is, you know, taking our jobs. Mm -hmm. But the argument to that is, you know, if these people are out chucking bricks at police officers on a Wednesday afternoon, you would argue that there's not much work going on there either. Oh, absolutely. And I, and I don't disagree with that. And I'm, I'm not of the opinion that we should bow to a, a right-wing audience in the slightest. But given the, say, the sort of the state of everybody's uh, passion, let's call it, in this country at the moment, I think that it is just adding more fuel to hatred of certain groups of people. They don't need that. There is already enough fear going around. So I think that you need to take that emotion out of it. But it is just the fundamental problems of the United Kingdom system that it doesn't make it easy to do that. It doesn't make it easy to transition into work. And they're not all doctors and lawyers. There will be some. Um, I'm quite open to, to people coming to this country, so please don't think that I come from an anti-immigration point of view. But I think you have to be incredibly careful when you look at skill sets. I helped to rehome a Syrian family, and one of the uh, young people involved was an accountant, had been through university, had trained. The qualifications did not match up with the professional qualifications in this country. And that is no fault of anybody's. And the poor girl had to go back and basically resit pretty much her accountancy exams. Now that took her at least another 18 months. So it isn't as simple as saying that because they're qualified, they can come in and do it. I don't see a problem with community work whatsoever. I think that is incredibly helpful. And a lot of the most successful schemes that I saw were working in sports clubs, yeah. working with young people and just being around a community, not taking anything but actually giving something and it helps everybody because some people have never met somebody from a different country before yeah that's and exactly i think right. you take that fear away yeah. you take that yeah. problem that's exactly Normal, right yes. and i wanted to pick up on the word fear that was in my head for the next my next contribution because if you look at places like brixton where there's integration and people live next to each other then by and large people don't have a problem the people who have problems and are worried about things by and large are white communities who've got no um, external people coming from anywhere else living in those communities and they're worried about being quote swamped that's that's what's happening but it, when people integrate that goes away because you know we are all human beings and people get on with each other and they help each other you know irrespective of race and mm. anything else yeah. and so integration is a way to deal with this fear you know one of the things we forget we forget our history there were 5,000 troops of Indian origin stationed in Brighton in the First World War. Yeah, and you don't see them in the, in the films, by the way. No, all you the don't. Yeah. They're, all, they're all white soldiers. And, and what they did, the British Army, I think, in its desire to have people um, fight on the Western Front, they accommodated those troops. The local community adopted those troops, by and large. And there was a huge groundswell of, I suppose, mutual respect. And so I think if the effort is put in, as Claire said, I absolutely agree. The problem is that people have seen it as a black or white issue. It never is. And so one of the things that I've been delighted to see is the leaders of some of the mosques opening their doors to some of the people who are rioting <coughs> and taking that fear back and saying, listen, we are not the problem. We were not a problem in the First World War, the Second World War. And if you go to Epes and you see the monument at the Men in Gate, you will know exactly why that is not a problem. And if, in a sense, it hadn't been for those people, there would be United, known the United Kingdom today. So I think people have to relearn that history uh, and view this as a thing that, collectively, Britain can do far better than this. Claire, of all the problems in the in-tray that Keir Starmer has inherited, where do you think he sees this issue? <laughs> Oh, it, it's very difficult to say because, unfortunately, I think he's falling into the trap of putting it front and centre of everything that he does. 
when you speak to people out on the streets away from politics, it isn't one of their highest issues in the slightest. They, cost of it's living. the cost of living, it's GP appointments, it's schools, it's potholes in the road. Those are the kind of things that fundamentally make a difference to their lives. If you, in, you introduce immigration into a conversation, then people have an opinion about it, but they don't offer it up straight out of the bat. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we need to tell Keir Starmer, hey, you won the election. Just remember, you won the election with a massive majority. You are not the Conservative Party. You're not the Conservative Party that you inherited it from. Um, you can do something different. But unfortunately, what they're doing is, to use a Scottish word, they're frit, I think. They're scared. They're, they're, they're following the same uh, priorities uh, and the same road, they're going on the same road as the previous Conservative government. That's been rejected by the public heavily. Um, and not just because of the policies, for other reasons too, but the policies were rejected. They can start with a fresh piece of paper. Um, it shouldn't carry on the same way. I've seen transport announcements today here in the UK where they're following conservative policy. You know, do something different. Follow your own members, follow your agenda, because what's happening now in government is a continuation to a large degree of what happened before. Be brave. You won the election. Peter, there's one issue in the UK that fascinates me. Nine million economically inactive adults. And these are all people that... You know, if you speak to people and they're either not looking for work or they're not in work, but they will all have <clears throat> an opinion on migration. How big of an issue is that piece of the population not actually contributing anything to modern Britain? Nine million economically inactive adults. I mean, I, I challenge the premise in a way, because just because people aren't active today doesn't mean to say they, they have not contributed. And just because you're in a capitalist system, you shouldn't necessarily be measured solely by your ability to earn money for somebody else or even yourself. And so I, I think there are all sorts of ways in which people are involved in a community. And yes, they have a right. And they have a right to an opinion. And I would defend that. Um, but I think we, we ought not to make any one group the sole determinant of what is good for Britain as a country. Uh, and therefore, it's a shared responsibility, a shared ownership. And you're, you have a right to vote, whether you, you're working tomorrow or yesteryear, or whether you're suffering from a disability or you're, or you're not. But I think it is part of an understanding that must be driven to those communities. And as I said, as Claire said, if, if communities' work is something that they would recognize and value, then it can be done in a, in a way with dignity and include those people. Uh, and, and so I... I sort of don't undermine people's right to have a view at all, quite the reverse. What we shouldn't allow, though, is the Nigel Farage's of this world to dictate the agenda. And therefore, Keir Starmer has to be strong, he has to be determined, and has to be principled. And, and so the suggestion that these riots were protests is a complete and utter fallacy. Claire, just on the mention of his name, he's gone very quiet lately, hasn't he? I wonder why that is. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, that when you get somebody with an opinion like that, they put it out on social media, they get their fan base riled up enough to go out into the streets and fight police officers, but when the consequences come, they go quiet. And I think at the moment with Mr Farage, he's taking a back seat saying, this isn't my fault, I will, uh, you know, I just put out some words, it wasn't me. Um, and I think he's gone off to America to, to go and play with the American presidential election process that is going on. And there's a contrast between the American situation and here, because if you could look at America, Trump can come out and say all these mm. things which don't have any fact behind them. I wonder if we've been told the truth, that sort of statement which Trump will yeah. make, it will just land. When Nigel Farage makes a statement, people say, actually, what do you mean we don't, we don't tell the truth? We're told the truth because we have a media in this country which is regulated by Ofcom and which, by and large, people can trust uh, broadcast media. And it's not the case in the States. So it's different. And when he says that, people don't think, oh, you might be right. Most people think, you know, what are you talking about? You know, you're stirring things up. And he was, people saw through him. And that's why he's gone quiet, I but, think. But in I the meantime, of course, he's earning a great deal of money on broadcast and, and a lot from his MP yes. salary. But I, I do think the problem, you're right, that broadcast media has got uh, a regulator, but social media doesn't. That's right. And, and I think therein lies your problem, yeah. is that you can put out seemingly pretty much anything you like mm. on social media with no basis of fact whatsoever. Mm. And... <clears throat> 
people are now finding the consequences are actually criminal because Keir Starmer and his government, for once, I think they have done exactly the right thing by coming down hard on these rioters mm. because you can't allow civil disobedience to go unchecked like that. But I think that it brings in that wider conversation about what you do with social media, how you deal with the platforms, who is publishing the information and what those consequences That's a, are. a topic for another day. Peter, I want to mm. ask you just finally, what will success look like for Starmer in terms of dealing with Britain's migration? I think taking, as the, all the panelists have said, uh, the long-term view. It is not a, a quick fix. It is starts deep inside countries which are sometimes failed states, with genuine persecution and need and hunger and human rights abuses. And I certainly, being an, in a refugee camp in Lebanon for a week, gave me an insight into what people really suffer. And, and so who would ever choose to be sitting in a, a tent in near the Israeli border in South Lebanon um, if out of choice rather than being in their home? And they, being in their home does not include coming to sit in Britain on benefits in a hotel on the M4. That is not their idea of a future. So I think Starmer can do so, but he, he needs to use some imagination and some courage, as you've said quite rightly, make use of that majority and get to work. Peter, Claire, Norman, thank you all so much for your analysis. Remember, you can see more discussion and debate on our YouTube channel. Just search for Roundtable TRT World. And if you like what you see there, please do hit that subscribe button. But for now, from me and the Brady and all of the team here, goodbye and thank you for watching.